We set out around two, hoping to time it so we could arrive just before sunset. Grandpa claimed he wanted to channel the dying day into the ceiling magic. I just nodded, hoping to see what he was talking about. Grandpa had woken me up that morning way earlier than I had wanted. I could see the light was still soft, not the middle of the morning light I was expecting. Grandpa was shaking me frantically, telling me we needed to get ready, and I had tried to wave him off. I had stayed up late, Glimmer's story taking longer than expected, and I'd only managed a few hours of sleep before Grandpa was shaking me. I'm tired, Grandpa. Let me get a few more hours. We may not have a few more hours, boy. It's gone for now, but it could be back any time. We need to be gone when it is. I sat up in bed, not having to ask what he meant. You found the house? Come out to the yard and see for yourself. When I stepped out onto the porch, I saw what he was talking about. The yard glistened with bones, long trails that had been left behind by something big, and more of those angry-looking shapes that were left around the house. They looked different from the ones I had disturbed. They were bristly, agitated, looking more like something you spray paint on the side of someone's house when you want to scare them. There were corpses in the yard, birds and squirrels and small animals of various sizes. They'd been pulped like so much raw fruit and left behind after their bones had been taken. We've got to get ready. When this thing comes back, I want to be long gone. It was almost two by the time we got everything together, and that was when I finally got a good look at it. As we walk through the woods now, I kind of wish I hadn't. I really wish I had seen this thing cold when we did whatever it was we were going to do tonight. I'm not sure I'll still have the nerve with the image of this creature knocking around in my head. However large I had imagined it was didn't do it justice. This creature is far worse than anything I could have imagined, and the thought that it might be, even now, stalking us through the woods makes my skin crawl. We were heading out the front when Grandpa suddenly yanked me back inside. I got a little angry, turning around to ask him what the hell was wrong with him, but he was already pushing me down and telling me to be as quiet as possible. I started to ask what he'd seen, but suddenly the light outside was blocked out. Something moved in front of the big front window on the porch, and I turned to see this giant pale monstrosity as it slithered by. Its torso and head were vaguely equine, its arms were like an odd combination of spider legs and human hands with too many fingers. It had four arms, pulling itself along with great suffering pulls, and its hands ended in what might have been fifteen pale white fingers. Its bottom half was more like a walrus, a bulbous end with a wide fin, and I couldn't imagine how it didn't churn up the ground with each struggling yank of that bulbous thing. There was... there was flesh on its bones, some of them, at least, and it looked pieced together from too many different bones to make sense of. The mouth and fingers might have been delicate avian bones. The bulk of it might have been bear or horse bones, and its mouth was filled with a collection of too many teeth to make sense of. When it turned its head, I was captured by those sunken black pits of eyes an instant before I could get below the edge of the window. Those eyes had seen me, and I had seen too much in them. Suddenly the house shuddered as it slammed into the front porch, and Grandpa took my arm as he yelled for me to follow him out the back. It sounded like the hell beast was destroying the porch as we came onto the back area, and Grandpa took the back steps two at a time as we ran for the woods. The forest canopy was its home, but it suddenly seemed much safer than the false safety of the house. I started to ask Grandpa why his wards didn't keep the creature away, but he shushed me and led me deeper into that sea of green. We had walked for about an hour when he finally answered my question. I assume that the spells only fooled it for so long. It was the equivalent of a distraction, after all, and this creature is older than even I am. I kept listening for something huge following us, but the usual sounds of the forest were all I could hear. That was... that was comforting, since I knew that the forest dwellers didn't like this thing any more than we did. As long as I could hear the sounds of squirrels and birds... All was well. So, why didn't it come and get us in our sleep, I asked, not wanting an answer, but wanting to hear someone talk. Well, the wards on the trees aren't the only bit of misdirection that I have. The house is in a blind. 
that's what I've always called it, and it sort of stops things like the Bone Collector from finding us. It helps confuse things like the Welder Gas, too. Otherwise, I would have probably been found out years ago. We crunched through the woods, the sun beginning its low descent as we made our way for the stream. Grandpa seemed to move by intuition, taking paths and trails at random as his natural compass led him towards the stream. The pack I wore was heavy as it cut into my shoulders, and the sweat trickling down my face was beginning to attract gnats. Grandpa never seemed to feel his own pack, and as we walked along, I realized my anxiety might be weighing me down more than the pack. So, Gramps, how are we going to seal this thing? Well, most of the work is going to be done by the stream itself. It's an old stream, a place that's important to people long gone from here. The candles and herbs we have will help strengthen the location, and I think if we can lure it into the mud around the banks, we can trap it. And you're sure about this, I hedged, stepping around the arm of a spruce as I followed behind him. Of course, I've done things like this before. It's a simple sealing spell, nothing more. But, but that's where I floundered. Why was I pressing him so hard? I had never doubted Grandpa on these matters. I'd always understood that he knew more than I did, and if he said it would be okay, then it would be okay. Glimmer's story wouldn't leave me so easily, though, and I felt ashamed in my doubt as Grandpa kept his eyes ahead. It seemed, though, that the old man could read my mind. Glimmer told you my story. It wasn't a question. Yeah, not all of it, but she told me that, that you didn't really seal the bone collector last time. Grandpa turned around, but I could see him nod to the woods. She's right. I didn't seal him away. I tried, but I was young and only half trained. It was an event that led me to grow, but it was definitely one of the scariest times of my life. I followed behind him, waiting for his story to begin and realizing that he would make me ask him to tell it. He was ashamed of the story, ashamed of the lie, and he wouldn't tell it to me unless I asked. I had never had to wheedle a story out of Grandpa before, but it seemed that this one would take some doing. As he walked, the forest buzzing around us with a thousand voices, I couldn't take it anymore. Will you, will you tell me the story, Grandpa? The only reply was the sound of him crunching along, and I thought for a moment that he wouldn't respond. You sure you want to hear it? I'm not sure it'll help your nerves, given what we've got to do tonight. I do, I said, realizing this was the most important story of them all. This was not some cherry-picked Grandpa story. This was not a story that might make Grandpa seem brave or overly competent. This, this was a raw Grandpa tale, something that he might not have shared with anyone else. He had shared some of it with Glimmer, someone I was beginning to believe he had been more than friends with. But not all. I could very well be the first one to hear this particular skirmish, and I wondered how right Grandpa might be. How might this story change my outlook on tonight's activities? It all began with a man I hadn't seen since Grandma died. They had been friends of a sort, and now he was hoping that he could get some help in sealing away something dangerous. Something that could be very bad for his church and the people in it. The man was Reverend Tucker, and he had a nasty something in the graveyard behind his church. He found me one afternoon as I slumped against the wall of the local rot gut dispensary. I was drunk as a lord, watching the street light as it winked on and off, and thinking again of the lights that had taken my friends. The blinking light reminded me of them, but I was too tanked to do much more than sit and stare. When someone stepped in front of the light, I blinked and looked up into the unforgiving face of Reverend Tucker. By my guess, he was between forty and sixty, and he had that look of someone who will look forty until he dies. He had lifted me up by the shirt front, drawing me to eye level as he told me how much my grandmother would have been ashamed to see me like this. She wanted better than this for you, boy. She always doted on you, and it would kill her all over again to see you in such a state. 
I pulled away and asked him what the hell he wanted. I hadn't been serious about my lessons in a long while, but that didn't mean I had forgotten them. I continued my studies, reading over Grandma's old books whenever I had the chance. Lately, I had found myself with more time than usual since my friends were dead, and I had decided to be ready the next time something came my way. I didn't have Grandma to fall back on anymore, and it would be down to me next time. We have a problem, and unfortunately you're the only one here that might be able to help me. I need you to sober up and come with me. We'll get you some coffee in the rectory once we get there, but I need your expertise, and I need it to be coherent. I thought about getting indignant, but there was really no sense arguing with him. He was right, and I felt a deep sense of shame at how I had acted. My grandma would have been ashamed of me if she could see me like this. How many times had she lost more, done worse, and still kept her head? She didn't give up, and neither could I. I would be no sort of man if I did, and as I rubbed my head and apologized to the old holy man, I went with him to see what had taken up residence in his church. Turns out that the graveyard was where my predecessor had sealed the bone collector last time. The old Zion graveyard was part of Zion's Peak Methodist Church, and it was where Reverend Tucker had preached until they had built him a shiny new church closer to town. The house of worship had been experiencing a soft move for the last two years, but Tucker had discovered something awful the last time he'd gone to the old church. Something had wrecked the graveyard and drug a furrow through the worship hall. It was like a tree had fallen through the building and then simply slithered away. I wasn't sure what to make of it. And then I remembered what your grandma told me once. Do you remember when she exercised that thing out of my house? Well, she told me that I had to keep an eye on Zion Peak because it contained a very dark secret. A secret she had hoped to never face again. That's when she told me that, in her own youth, she had sealed that monster inside the cemetery. It had escaped its old resting place and killed 16 people before she found it. She had tracked it to the cemetery and found it desecrating corpses for their bones. She had sealed it in the old Wainwright crypt, warding the vault and seal so that no one would disturb it and release the horrors that lay below. Well, it turned out the people would be the least of her worries. The spirit was released when a tree fell on the crypt during a windstorm, and now it's running rampant. The bone collector had killed 13 so far, several of them children, and Reverend Tucker asked me to stop its reign of terror before others took notice. I tracked it for a week, following its trail of destruction as I prepared to put it back in the ground. When I wasn't tracking it, I was devouring everything I could about the creature, reading over all of Grandma's old journals and notes on the thing, buried below the graveyard. I learned its name and what it was capable of, and the warden spell that would put it back to sleep. I finally managed to track it to an old gravel pit, a recent hotspot for missing persons, and I assembled the things I would need to get the job done. I went to the pit around sunset. Grandma's notes had been clear that a spell cast around the end of the day and the beginning of night would be full of power and might give me the edge I needed to seal the bone collector away. I set up my circle and practiced the chance I would need. I cut my palm and sent out my intent drawing the creature to me. As the sun set and the darkness began to move across the land, I heard it dragging itself out of one of the deep tunnels in the pit. He was munching on whatever poor miner had been found down there and began to drag itself towards me. I spoke the words, drawing him into the trap I had set for him, and as he passed into the trigger, I prepared to close the teeth on him. I threw out the last of it, spilling all my intent and desire, but when I opened my eyes, I saw it towering over me with a look of bemusement stretched across that bony face. It had felt my warden, heard my intent, and found me wanton. As I stared at the creature, I felt confident that I was about to be its latest victim. 
We stopped for a moment, Grandpa checking his bearings, and that's when I realized something that the story had stopped me from recognizing. The forest was dead silent around us. The birds and animals, even the bugs had gone silent, and I could hear the faintest of draggings as something came closer and closer to us. When the trees burst apart and the bone collector loomed over us, I was pretty sure I would never get to hear the end of Grandpa's story. Not unless his bones could talk after the bone collector had finished stripping them down and adding them to his form. Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. Thank you so much for joining me for tonight's story. I hope you enjoyed part three, with a little help from my friend, the Baron Landred, and I hope you've been enjoying the voice talents of La Dama de Blanca this week, reprising her role as Glimmer. They're both longtime friends of the show, and I really couldn't do my collabs without them. I'd like to thank them both for their hard work this week, and just let them know how much I appreciate them. Speaking of appreciation, I appreciate all of you for coming back for night three. If you're not already subscribed, maybe go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Maybe hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the spooky stuff we do here. Maybe even leave me a comment if you feel so inclined. The algorithm and I really like it when you comment. If you'd like to support the show, come on down to Patreon. We have multiple tiers to suit any need. We also give you your spooky a day early on a Tuesday and a Thursday on a normal week. So you get your videos and your stories a day early. You also get your name read out at the end of every TikTok and every YouTube video I do. Speaking of, let's go ahead and do that. Thanks to Janet for being our spooky skeleton tier contributor. Thanks to Emily Coltsfoot, Leslie Lou Riddle, Zoronin, Martha, and Mary Ann Schuler for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you'd like to become one of my patrons, you can find a link below. You can also find a link to my books on Amazon. Sleepless Nights recently came out. It's my fourth compilation, but you can find all of them there on my profile. So, if that's something that interests you, go on and have a look. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.